Good afternoon, everybody. This is Yelena Subasic at Dean Dorton. Um, happy Wednesday. I hope everyone's been having a great week so far, and hopefully you all have a longer weekend to look forward to. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us today on this special Cloud Bytes we're doing on the new Sage Intact release, too. We're super excited. We have a lot of new customers joining, and probably the most that we've had for one of um, these webinars. So we're excited. It's a good session today. Hopefully you'll learn a lot. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody that um, please don't hesitate to ask any questions um, during or after the presentation. We'll have some time at the end for a Q&A. But if at any time during the presentation you have questions, there's a chat box. Um, to the right side of your screen where the GoToWebinar panel is. So just type in anything and we'll address that question um, at an appropriate time. So again, thanks everybody for joining and I will hand this off to Jim Norton. Great, thank you. Hi everybody, uh, this is Jim Norton. I'm a senior technology consultant with Dean Norton Allen Ford. I'm here to talk to you about release 2019 for Sage Intact. Uh, release time is probably one of my favorite times every quarter. It's the best day ever, as SpongeBob says, because <laughs> we get all this new functionality that uh, a lot of times people have been asking for and waiting for for a while, and this release is no exception. So um, what we're going to go over today is we're going to talk about the themes of release two, uh, and then go over the changes, which is going to be broken up into minor changes and major changes. Major changes are focused in contracts, inventory bank rec, purchasing and order entry, dynamic allocations, and the action UI. And then we'll leave some time for Q&A. Uh, please feel free to fire off your questions all throughout the presentation and we'll be monitoring them and we'll be sure to get to them. If for some reason there's anything that we can't answer on the spot, we will be sure to follow up with you as soon as we can. All right. So main themes for release two uh, are going to be uh, saving seconds to hours and reducing risk. So uh, basically what this, some of the things you're going to see here are navigating between a large number of entities is getting easier and faster, which will save you seconds off of every switch between entities. Um, ASC 606 compliance is easier for service-based businesses that use projects and contracts, which could save hours upon hours of spreadsheet work. You've got additional GL postings that can save hours uh, processing large reversals related to purchasing and order entry. Uh, recurring allocations and automated true up um, coupled with the prior enhancements that we have seen in dynamic allocations can shave days off of your allocation time with all these complex calculations and adjustments that up until now you've likely been doing in Excel. Uh, and we've got improved match handling for reconciliations so the customers can take advantage of the new bank rec functionality and save hours on bid reconciliation. In the reduced risk realm, uh, your risk of errors is reduced with an unlimited number of entity colors that help visually cue you to make sure that you're in the right entity. Uh, and then we eliminate errors associated with calculating variable consideration like price concessions, rebates, et cetera, uh, on expected revenue based on contingent events by automating it. And then uh, we're helping reduce the risk associated with delayed cash or non-payment by billing ahead when projects hit a certain percentage of completion. Uh, helping inventory-based businesses reduce the risk of stockouts uh, and loss of business by helping you account for seasonal items that have fluctuating demands. Uh, and then we're, we're changing the way we do allocation true up so that your adjustment and reversal post at the same time and help you to reduce any blind spots on year-to-date indirect costs or revenues. And then segregation of duties and bank reps, bank recs helps you prevent errors and fraud, especially for those of you that are in larger organizations. So uh, in our minor change realm, we've got these major um, areas that we're going to talk about which is accounts payable, administration, consolidation, projects, reporting and insights, and workflow. So in AP, uh, they've rolled out capability for you to filter and then pay, which let, lets you load bills by applying a filter, and then you can that lets you focus on just the bills that you want to pay at a certain time. Uh, in administration, you have more control now uh, over how Sage Intact handles 
third-party content that's not whitelisted in your content security policy. Uh, in consolidation, they've updated the way that consolidations are handled so that when you consolidate your book, uh, Intact is going to use the exchange rate date defined on each individual transaction line instead of just the date of the transaction, which gives you additional flexibility and predictability, uh, especially in the areas of deferred revenue and expenses. On projects, you're able to restrict transaction rules to only run for billable timesheet entries. In the reporting and insights world, um, during your dashboard creation, you can save some time because they've now rolled out two additional out-of-the-box dashboards for the companies using the general quick start template. Uh, these dashboards are set up so that you can get information on cash analysis and key financial ratios in one centralized place. And all you have to do is really activate those dashboards rather than have to sit there and figure out how to build them yourselves. Uh, and then we've also added the capability to prevent direct journal entries to control accounts, which are going to be things like your AP and AR account that are coming from some sub-module and some sub-ledger. In the workflow section, uh, we've got automated additional postings on user-defined books and purchase commitments to give you much faster uh, processing with fewer errors, and you can create a bunch of other time-saving workflows. So I want to demo some of this for you uh, because we've got some really good content here. So I'm going to switch over to my instance of Intact. Jim, can you make it um, yep. the slide mode? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. I'm so I'm about to switch and pull Intact over here. Right. Okay. So now everybody should be seeing Intact on my screen. So uh, I'm going to demo now the accounts payable functionality. So with accounts payable, I've created a filter in my demo environment, good old Hogwarts, which is my favorite. So when you come into accounts payable and you go to pay bills, you've got this filter by set. Now, if I have no filter at all, right, and I come into my list of bills to pay, you can see here's my total. I have 275,130 outstanding. Well, if I have a certain way that I always want to view my bills and I want to run that filter, and that's what I'm going to use to primarily determine how I make my payment, I can apply a filter. I've created this filter called the R2 filter. Now, when I go and apply that, notice that the total amount that I now have to, to pay is 264,400. Why is that? is because I set up a filter that we do anything that doesn't make meet my criteria. And what I want to see is I want to see all past due bills for all vendors that have an assigned term of net 30. So that's what this filter has done for me. It's really useful if you have a certain way that you always want to do your payment run. And if you come into the body of how this is actually set up, it's very simple. You come into edit filters and then you just define your criteria, right? So in this case, I want to see vendors where the term is net 30, and I want to see my due date range here is past due. Those two things have given me a sticky set of criteria, which I can now use to inform my future payment runs. Instead of recreating those every time you do a payment run, or exporting your outstanding bills list to Excel and then doing that whole process offline. So that's the accounts payable filtering that was rolled out. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is project transaction rule filtering. If you're using projects, you probably already know how useful and how powerful transaction rules are to help you calculate things like layered and direct or, or markup on certain transactions. Last time around in R1, Intact added the capability to flag entries posted from a transaction rule as a billable transaction. That was a huge plus for project-based businesses and nonprofits who might have to layer in some component of indirect or overhead before they invoice their client. Well, now we've got another great development that has some handy implications for folks who are using projects and they want to filter transaction rules so they only pick up billable timesheet entries. What this does is it gives you a lot more flexibility in how you craft the calculation of your amounts that are subject to a markup or an indirect. So maybe, and I'm sure those of you who are in a professional services type business come across things like this, if you've got certain types of time that you want to mark up before billing, and the rest of it is not going to be billed to your client, so you don't want it to be marked up. Well, now with the new billable only transaction definition capability, you can do just that. So if I come into my projects module here and I go to my transaction role, 
you can see it's super simple. It's when you go to add a transaction rule, there's this new checkbox that was not there until this release. And if you check that, it's only going to pick up your billable uh, lines. And you can, you can, you know, the sky's the limit as far as how creative you want to get with that. But on the surface, you pick up your billable lines, and that's what you, that's what you're going to apply, whatever rate it is that you want to apply to those transactions. Uh, in reporting and insights, as I mentioned, we've got some new dashboards that are available. Uh, the demo company that I'm using right now is actually a nonprofit demo, so you're not going to see those new dashboards here, but it brings up the concept that I still want to show you, which is how you access these dashboards, because some of you may never have actually seen the dashboard library. So I'm going to show you how to do that, and if your company is set up as a general quick start, then you're going to see these new dashboards from R2 in there. So when I come over to dashboards, there's this button for dashboards library. And depending on what quick start I was set up with during implementation, I'm going to see a set of dashboards that I can just pull that are pre-made. So in my case, you see I can go and I can just click install, give the dashboard a name, and hit save. And then the dashboard is going to be created in my instance. If you don't know what quick start uh, template you were set up with, because maybe it's been a while since your implementation or, you're, or you just forgot or whatever, you can easily check under your company setup and go to company. And if you go to your accounting page, it will tell you your setup template here. If your setup template on this screen says general, then you now have access to these new dashboards, which are going to give you additional out of the box insight on cash flow and financial ratios. The other nice little feature is the ability to designate control accounts and prevent users from hitting them when they make a GL entry. So I, I'm sure that those of you who are trying to tie your subledger and your AR aging or AP aging back to your GL have sometimes come across a situation where one of the staff has posted a journal entry and has decided to hit AR or AP, and now your general ledger and your subledger are potentially out of balance. Well, you can now control to make sure that that doesn't happen. And all you have to do for that is when you're editing a GL account, you'll see this new box that has showed up, which says disallow direct posting. When you click this disallow direct posting checkbox, it's not possible to hit this account anymore with a journal entry. Now, I think the next logical step that many of you may be thinking is, well, what if I'm in a multi-currency environment and I need to revalue my GL account periodically because the subledger is always revaluing itself and they never tie? Well, what I'd recommend in that case is that you actually have a separate GL called something like AR revaluation or AP revaluation. Make your revaluation entries to that account. And then when you're tying out your subledgers to the GL, group your revaluation account with your AR account and consider those together when you're tying out. That way, if something goes wrong, you know what the system did and what a, a human did and it will help you isolate and fix more quickly what the corrective action is that you need to take. Uh, next thing I want to talk about is uh, the workflow enhancement. So in this release, you gain the ability to post sales and purchases to user-defined books. Uh, many clients that I've worked with are doing a lot of their what if or their add back and estimated revenue expense type scenarios in Excel. So the ability to post sales and purchase transactions to a user-defined book and then automate reversing them is a real game changer because imagine if you had an agreement with one of your customers and you know the total value of that agreement is 100K, but you've only been able to bill and recognize 25K of that so far. So for your real financial statements, you're probably only showing 25K in revenue, but for your own forward-looking analyses, you want to know that you've got another 75K coming down the road and you want to be able to look at your reports and know what your reports are going to look like when that next 75K is included in your numbers. So this functionality lets you accomplish exactly that, and it's super simple to set up. So previously, your non-posting transactions, things like your purchase order transactions or your sale orders transactions, they were exactly that. They were non-posting, which means that you could not reflect them in any financial report. Well, now that we wrote out this feature in R2, you can select a box in your purchasing and your order entry transaction definitions, even if they're non-posting. And that is here. 
right? So if we take a look at our transaction definition in purchasing, for instance, you've got this box that you did not see before, and it's called enable additional posting. So here I've got don't post, and then I've got enable additional posting. Well, enable additional posting is now letting me post these transactions to a user-defined book so that I can include them for analysis purpose. And then once you've clicked this enable additional posting box, this will look really familiar to any of you who are working with purchasing or order entry. You've got this mapping table and this mapping table is saying when I use this item GL group, post to this account. And in my user defined books, these transactions are gonna hit my user defined books and I can include those user defined books in my report. And then I can have one column for my accrual book, one column for my user defined and a total. It gives you a forward looking picture of what your financials are going to look like while still retaining your accrual books that are quote unquote by the book and gap so that your audit is not gonna be a problem. All right, the great part about this is that since it's a non-posting transaction, it doesn't impact your real GL. And since your real GL is not impacted, as I said, you're not gonna have audit, audit issues. All right, so now I'm gonna move on to the next section of our content. All right, now we are into the major changes section. Uh, in contracts, right, contracts has come out with a few great enhancements in this uh, next release. They've added the ability to categorize your contracts with new contract types. Contract type behaves pretty similar to any other type fields that you're finding in the system. So those of you who are familiar with AR and AP, you know you've got a customer type, a vendor type. Basically, contract type uh, is another filter that you have to take advantage of and you can use them to build dimension groups and dimension structures and achieve reporting by that contract type. It's pretty straightforward functionality and it's similar to what we see in other areas of the system. Uh, this next one, which is uh, estimated variable consideration for T&E projects, uh, this one is a big deal for 606. So this gives you the capability to estimate variable consideration for time and material projects. That's exactly what ASC 606 says we need to do in order to recognize revenue properly on those projects. What it does is it lets you defer the revenue and then recognize it as your performance obligations are met. Uh, just a note, time and material projects are not yet available to be part of multi-element arrangement or MEA allocations, but that is on the roadmap for a future release. Uh, also, when you have overestimated your variable consideration, so maybe you thought that something was gonna bring in more revenue than it did, They've added in an automated tool that lets you click revalue, and then you can write down the rest of that estimate and reverse your unbilled portion. Very handy for those of you using contracts with variable consideration. So something that's linked to like a time and materials project. Uh, the next enhancement is the capability to bill projects at percent complete threshold levels. So until this release, it was not as easy to do your project invoicing out of contract if you had to deal with project percentage complete. In R2, we get that functionality. You've got billing templates for your project percent complete or task percent complete. And there's a step billing checkbox, which allows you to specify which percentage of a project has to get billed out as certain percentages of completion are reached. That's a great efficiency for any of you fixed fee project organizations out there. And it's very simple to set up, right? So if we take a look at a demo here, it's the, it's the um, let me just toggle over to that environment for you really quick. Okay, so in our contract module, you, those of you who are using contracts probably are familiar with billing templates. Well, now you've got your billing templates and your billing templates can be based on project percent complete and you can base it on a number of factors of that project percent complete. And if you check this step billing checkbox, you can then tell impact when you need to bill. 
So when I've hit a certain percentage of complete, maybe once I've completed 30% of the project, I want to bill 50% to my client. This billing template will help so that once you've hit that threshold percentage, when you go to generate invoice, that invoice is going to be available to send out to your client because it knows that you've hit that threshold. Okay, inventory. So an in inventory, um, they've, they've made some adjustments to help you manage seasonal and variable demand forecasts so that you can use do a demand forecast by fluctuating values. You can replenish based on your forecast, current stock, and actual orders. And you've got more visibility into the actual landed cost distribution details. So, uh, you know, replenishment needs are not always going to be static. So in this release, they allow you to manage your seasonal or fluctuating replenishment forecast using a new method, which is called demand forecast by fluctuating values. And it lets you define variable inventory needs by date. So what is this controlling for? It's really controlling for seasonality. And it helps you to, to not run out of stock by using you know, the same kind of uh, straight line forecast of demand. It lets you build some dynamic forward-looking analyses into your demand forecast. Next one is bank rec. Uh, this one is another big deal. I, as I said last time when I did the R1 presentation, people have been asking for a lot of the bank rec functionality that they've been rolling out for a while. And R1, they delivered a lot of great new functionality. And R2, they've done it again. So uh, what we now have is we've got the capability to do segregation of duties. It separates the permission for key functions of the bank rec so that one person can reconcile another person can review and finalize, and then another person can review the report. Previously, there was no way to separate all those different duties. And if you had permission to do the reconciliation, you essentially had permission to do it all, right? And then the second thing is they, they had enhanced match handling, which lets you manually select and match voided and reverse transactions within impact when you're reconciling via import. Previously, you had to do the avoided and reverse transactions separately as like a second step. So now essentially you can do it in one. All right. Uh, so how did they achieve uh, the, these new levels of permissions? Well, here's how they achieved it. If we take a look at what permissions look like now. So if I go over to company admin, this environment happens to have user-based permissions, but it could be users or roles. Take a look at the subscriptions that are available. Now, if we look at cash management and we look at permissions, you will see, oh, this is an employee user. Hopefully, they're never able to do that. So let's go to a business user. And if we look at cash management for a business user, now you see we've got these new layers of permissions. So those of you who have not yet uh, tapped into this in your environment, head over to your permissions and you'll see that you've got some new permissions to potentially assign to different people in your organization. Generally speaking, it's a really good idea to go look at your permissions after every release comes out because inevitably when they roll out new functionality, something in that new functionality is going to be tied to a permission that wasn't there before because the capability didn't exist before. So this is a great example of that. Now, if you want to segregate your duties and you want one person to reconcile uh, and another person to be able to view the report, then you can isolate that all you want by either giving the user different permissions, if you're user-based, or creating roles that have different sets of permissions. Okay, so so just to be clear, there's three three paths you can take here. You've got the first person, and if the first person had permissions that looked like this, they didn't have reconcile permission, and they didn't have report, that person would be able to go into the reconciliation check off everything that matched up and save. They would not be able to click reconcile. Once you turn on this permission to click reconcile, that next person would be able to go into the reconciliation, review what was done and click reconcile. And then the, the third level is they'd be able to go and report. Now, maybe you want somebody who's viewing to not be able to do a reconciliation. It's very common in organizations that if somebody is responsible for sending out payments, you don't want them to also be able to reconcile the bank. Well, now you can take that away from them using this permission. All right. 
Uh, purchasing and order entry. We talked about this already, um, but it was so good that we wanted to mention it twice, I guess. So um, in purchasing and order entry, you've got additional GL posting the user defined books. Uh, what this lets you do just to reiterate and reemphasize because it is a really powerful feature that you can get a lot of benefit out of is uh, in purchasing, you can track your spend commitments and then automate the reversal when the, the, the invoice is booked to AP. In order entry, you can track expected incoming funds and then automate the reversal when it's booked to AR. What does that give you? Well, it gives you visibility into your net commitments for spend management. And don't confuse that with the spend management module, which is an additional step above, which actually validates things against your budget. But this lets you, if you don't have spend management, still have visibility into what your financials are gonna look like when you layer in those commitments. So in this example you see on the slide here, you've got your actual, which is what's actually been booked, and then here is the future revenue that I know is coming in, and here are the future expenses that I know I'm gonna have to be putting out. And when I compare that against my budget, it tells me how much of my budget is left, right? So my, you can think of these, and you can also display these as a single column and call it actual with commitments if you don't wanna see the breakout. You have the flexibility to do either way. And you can automate via the use of transaction definition so that once something is converted to an AP invoice or an AR invoice, your commitment gets reversed, goes away, and essentially is moving into this actual column. Dynamic allocation. Uh, dynamic allocation is one of the newer modules in the intact world, but <laughs> we've consistently been seeing some really powerful enhancements to this module quarter over quarter. Uh, R2 is no exception. There's been another round of great updates to this module. Uh, as you can see, we can automatically true up post period changes to eliminate blind spots, simultaneous reversal and correction, recurring allocations. We've got expanded basis options and we've got complete automation, which essentially this is gonna shift from hours of manual calculation to running an allocation and having Intact pick up all that allocation for you. And then you're focusing on oversight and analysis rather than all the time it takes to calculate that allocation. So uh, recurring allocations, they allow you to schedule an allocation individually, or you can schedule a group of allocations to run. And as you may know, if you have a group of allocations, you can control which allocation happens in which order so that your data remains valid if you have any dependencies between your allocations. You can increase the frequency on which you are running allocations so that when you do them on a recurring basis, essentially you can adopt a set it and forget it mindset, you know, unless you need to make changes. Otherwise, it will just run and your numbers will always be allocated. Now, a nice complement to, um, to the recurring allocation is the true up functionality that they've released. What the true up functionality does is it lets you adjust your allocated figures uh, when your basis amounts have changed if it would produce a different allocation. You've got two approaches you can take there. One of the approaches is called an activity delta, which basically looks at your source amount since last time you ran the allocation and then allocates those. Or you can do an auto reverse prior post. And when you do an auto reverse prior post method, it's gonna reverse your previous allocation and then rerun the allocation and post your new allocation as if the previous one didn't happen. So your reversal and your new allocation will hit on the same GL posting date so that you're, you're always getting your numbers consistently and you don't have any blind spots. Uh, basis expansion is hugely important. So uh, a previous limitation of the dynamic allocations module used to be that you could only allocate based on P&L accounts and that you could only allocate uh, based on the activity for a period. Not the case anymore now that we have R2. So now we can allocate based on balances that may be living in a balance sheet account and a cumulative balance for a statistical account. There's an accumulation method of ending balances now. So what that means is you can now allocate your numbers based on things like period end headcount or a period end cumulative balance in some statistical account that's constantly changing, like maybe number of customers or number of vendors, or number of anything. That's really what statistical accounts are for. Uh, this module is really powerful and really reasonably priced. As somebody who was a controller previously that spent literally full days worth of time doing allocations, and then after I did that, I would always spend at least another day redoing them when things changed, I really wish that I had something like this. 
Uh, and then another nice little perk is you can add attachments to your allocation definition now. So now you've got the capability, if you're looking back at an attachment and somebody else needs to understand it, you can go click the attachment that's on that transaction allocation and maybe you've got your allocation policy attached to that or some document that explains why you're doing it that way and your auditors or your staff can review that. Uh, let's take a quick look at this because it's it's really nice functionality that I want to point out. All right, so the for dynamic allocation, you've got an allocation here, right? This is your standard transaction allocation. If you're using dynamic allocations, you've got this additional button called account allocation definition. Now, if I go to add that, I'm just going to show you kind of what the options are and what's new. So this attachments feature is new. You can attach something to your uh, to your allocation definition, and then you're going to walk through and tell it, you know, what am I what am I looking to allocate? What am I looking to not allocate, et cetera? That's what the dimension treatment section means. Your source pool is um, what's the source of your allocation, aka what am I looking to allocate, right? Um, that. You know, not not a lot of big changes there, except for this true up that I talked about. So you've got your activity delta, which is going to allocate anything that gets posted after you run an allocation, or auto reverse, which is going to undo and redo to give you the most up to date allocation. Now in basis, basis means what am I allocating based on? And this is where we've seen some really good changes. So now we've got the capability to allocate based on balance sheet accounts, right? Which did not previously show up in this drop down. And our accumulation method could now be ending balance. Previously, it was only activity, which caused you to have to do some kind of funky workarounds or um, do it offline. But now that you have ending balance and activity as your options, there's really no need to do those kinds of workarounds anymore. It's gotten exponentially easier to manage. Okay, um, Action UI. So Action UI is what we're saying is the new default. Um, basically, when you log into your product now, as all of you and undoubtedly already know, you are, are dropped into the Action UI by default. You can switch back to the previous UI, but um, if you switch back to the previous UI, you're gonna get a pop-up box that says, why are you doing this? Just so they can get some feedback because we're getting closer and closer to the point where the Action UI is gonna be the only UI. Uh, as you've noticed, the capability to switch back to the Action UI is not a, a discrete button up in the top like it used to be. It's now buried in your uh, user preferences, right? So some of the new things that came out specifically for the Action UI are uh, a recently used entity. So if you've got a lot of entities, the, the most recently used 10 entities are gonna pop up in your screen and then unlimited entity colors which basically it allows you to assign a color to the entity which just gives you another visual cue as to which entity you're in and it could be uh, a red flag um, or a blue flag if you chose a different color for your entity right that you're in the wrong spot uh, these colors are set at the company level and they can be overridden by the user so each user can set their preference for what it's going to look like Right, but you can set a master at the company. Um, you know, Intax plan is to continue to listen to your feedback and and increase the their focus in future releases so that you get even more improvements to the Action UI that make it more productive. Uh, but please remember, a lot of the enhancements that we talk about um, and certain features of the product, not only in this release but from prior releases, are only available in the Action UI. So. We really consider you, we really encourage you to consider the Action UI your primary UI. There's a lot of power under the hood and it's only going to keep getting better with each release. Uh, so, with that, I wanted to leave some time for anybody that has questions. So, do we have any questions? Um, we'll give it a second for some to come in. Please feel free again to type them in the chat box and we'll go over them. Um, can you, there is one, can you um, explain a little bit in more depth some of the new things that are available with the Action UI? Sure, I can do that. Um, let me just 
so with with the action UI, right? Um, the, the the functions here, right? The entity picker, for instance, uh, in this pre in this current release, is only in the action UI. The entity color picker is only in the action UI. But if we look back across developments that have happened in the past year and a half or so, uh, pay bills. So the AP workbench which is when you go into accounts payable and you select pay bills, this is only available in the action UI. So this, all this filtering and this enhanced workflow, if you're in the old UI, you're not gonna have it. You're gonna have this old select bills to pay, which obviously still has the old look, but also is limited in its functionality. See, you're missing a lot here. There's no filtering, for instance. There's no um, you know, AP workbench flow. So that's one great example of something that's only available in the Action UI. Other things that are only available in the Action UI, so the, the interactive custom report writer that Intact launched relatively recently is only available in the Action UI. Um, global consolidations, uh, a lot of the global consolidations functionality is only available in the Action UI. Uh, bank reconciliation, so the bank rec, uh, especially the new way, quote unquote new way, because it was just released, I believe, in R1, the new way of doing bank recs, only available in the Action UI, that helps you handle larger bank reconciliations faster with more automation. Um, and then uh, there's, there's an enhanced reports menu, right? So to go to the report center, right? Everything you need to create or build reports is in this report center. That's only in the Action UI. Uh, and then when you're viewing a report, you can select a specific uh, density for that report. So, you know, based on how your readability. So you can choose compact, moderate, or relaxed. That's only available in the Action UI. So those are, that's an overview of things just over kind of the past year that are only in the Action UI. And the, the, as, as I said, the, the longer, you know, as time goes on, the more enhancements that they roll out, I expect to see more and more things that are Action UI exclusive. Awesome. Um, well, Jim, I think that's it. Would you mind going back to the PowerPoint real quick and sure. skipping to the sure. next slide? I just wanted to um, yep. let everybody yep. know we'll have um, – we're, we always send out a couple weeks ahead of time before these cloud bites, the topics and the sign up. So the next one for June is going to be kind of a deeper dive into the new action UI and we'll be demoing some things. So just some best practices um, apart from what Jim said. So, but um, again, if you have any questions, if you have any ideas for topics, please feel free to reach out to us. We're always here to help. We're always here to listen to you all. Um, these are made to benefit you guys. So um, again, thanks everybody for joining. Um, oh, wait, I just saw a question oh. come in. Oh, sure. Um, Jim, can you see that one? It's kind of, it's a little bit longer if you want to read it. Let me check, yeah. Um. Okay, so uh, the question is, wi within the purchasing module, when creating a purchase requisition, there used to be a blog area at the bottom of the screen where you could make notes and add attachments for other users to see. It is no longer there. Um, it sounds to me like you may be talking about Intact Collaborate. Um, and let me see, if I have Collaborate turned on in this demo environment that I'm working on, maybe we can confirm. Right, so uh, Intact Collaborate is on in this in this demo environment. So basically, if you're using Intact Collaborate, which is a great feature um, within Intact, and you are viewing certain records, you have something like this, right, where you can tag people, you can say at, and then if somebody else is set up. Uh, within your organization using Collaborate, you can make a post to them, uh, share it kind of like a social feed, attach a file, give a link to something. If you're using Salesforce, it is uh, an extension of Salesforce Chatter. So there are certain transactions where you can tag back and forth re regarding Salesforce. Uh, so I'm not sure if, if that answers your question. Um, 
that that or if you're if I'm at least correct that you're talking about collaborate, maybe um you can submit a an email to support at masseyconsulting.net and we can look into that issue for you because it sounds like it may be something with uh your collaborate function maybe needing to be turned on. Okay. Um yeah, and we'll reach out personally to double check on that. But um if no one else has any other questions, like I said, um, enjoy your long weekend. If you have one, we will be closed on Monday. Um, I'll be sending an email about that and support how that will work. But um, I hope everyone has a great rest of the week. And thanks again thanks. for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Bye.